Good morning. Good to see you all. Welcome to The Journey. I'm Pastor Michael Jarbo, lead pastor of The Journey. Thank you so much for being in worship today. If you're a new guest, if you're trying us out, thank you. There's a ton of great churches here in Houston, so thank you for giving us a try today. And if this is your church home, welcome back. It's good to see you. And we're on the second week of Advent. And you already saw just kind of in a little bumper video there, we are in a series called Relative Grace. It's our Advent series. And we're looking at the relatives, the, the family tree, of Jesus. And when you open Matthew uh, chapter 1, you get to read uh, a bunch of names. That's how it begins. It's not some like cool little poem or something like, like funny to kind of get you connected to Matthew. It's just the genealogy of Jesus from Abraham all the way down to Jesus. And so over the course of these four or five weeks, we're going to be picking and looking at different names throughout that list and seeing how God worked with them. And today we're looking at a woman by the name of Rahab. And Rahab's got an interesting story. It's in the Bible. Uh, and uh, we, at 930, we had a, a precious family uh, jo- uh, become, uh, have their baby, Kennedy Sue, baptized at 930. So sweet. And uh, they were outside the worship space last week. And uh, I said, hey, I'm preaching next week. And they're like, and Kennedy's getting baptized. I'm like, yay. And I that put the piece together. I was like, I'm preaching on Rahab the prostitute next week for your baptism with all your family coming to town. I was like, I'm preaching on the Right, right, have the prostitute. They're like, we'll give them a warning. Thank you. Uh, appreciate you telling us that up front. So, right, again, it's in Scripture. We're going to hear the story of one of Jesus' distant relatives, a woman named Rahab. It's in the story. It's in the book of Joshua. Uh, in the Old Testament, if you have your Bible, turn open to Joshua chapter 2. If not, we've got the words right up here on the screen. You can follow along and, uh, and hear this story uh, that opens up the space. We're going to read verses 1 through 14 this morning, kind of get a glimpse of Rahab's story and connection here. And again, once again, I'm so thankful that you're here this morning. Uh, Let's go. Here we go. Joshua chapter 2, verse 1. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go, look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. King of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. And so the king of Jericho sent his messengers, uh, this message to Rahab, bring out those men who came to you and entered your house because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me. But I did not know where they had come from. And at dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. I, I, I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. I love the parenthesis here. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. So the men sent out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up to the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you have completely destroyed. We, when we heard of it, Our hearts melted in fear, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God of heaven above and on earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what we're doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. This, my friends, is the word of God for us, the people of God. And together we all say, thanks be to God. Amen. And amen. I know you all have been waiting with bated breath. So excited after I shared with you last year about how important I take 
my Hallmark Christmas movie fantasy league I'm a part of. Yeah, some of you, some of you know this. If you're new to this community, I got to tell you, it's a big deal for the Jarbo house. This is important stuff. While my fantasy football team is currently four and eight, I'm going to go for the gold here on the Hallmark Christmas movie fantasy league that I'm in. Let me give you a little scope of what this is about. Some of you are like, what is he talking about? This is a 70 team league, 70 teams. We put $15 in, I'll go to charity. And what you do is of all the new Hallmark movies out for 2022, there's about 25 of them. You pick three different teams, excuse me, not three different teams, three different movies to follow along with. And the movies accrue points based on the characters doing certain things. So if like the main dude is wearing a flannel shirt, one point. If there's a live reindeer, reindeer, one point. If the crush kisses his other crush on or before Easter, or excuse me, Christmas Eve, three points. If someone befriends the mayor or gets sage wisdom from Santa, five big old <laughs> points. There's a long list. It's real. I promise you. Uh, let me tell you, friends, I'm a busy man this season, but I took this really seriously. I needed a win. And so instead of normally like blindly picking based on the title of the movie or maybe like a small summary, I, I can't believe I'm telling you this. I went to YouTube and watched 25 30 second clips of the promos of all the video, trying to detail and see how many points I could rack up so I could wreck shop on all of my competition. That was my goal this year. Let me tell you the truth, friends. Even watching all of those promos, I still have no idea how many points I'm going to score with these movies. And so I'm just asking for your blessings and prayers and thoughts on the three teams I picked. So the, the first movie I picked is called Haul Out the Holly. Um, the second one is the Holiday Spectacular, which is like, I can't believe I'm saying, is a docu-series on the, uh, on the Rockettes. And finally, coming in for gold, Christmas Cookie Catastrophe. So wish me luck, friends. Wish me luck. Why do we watch these movies? Why, why are they a part of it? Maybe some of you are stay far away from them. I get it. They are not cinema wonders by any means. Uh, the characters and actors aren't going to win any awards for these movies. I think I watch it, and maybe you're like me. I watch it because it gives me a bit of reprieve from the busyness of the season right now. Like, I can be super stressed out but if I turn on a Christmas movie and the plot is these two childhood friends rekindling their relationship after making a snow globe together in South Louisiana, I, I feel some peace inside my heart. It gives me breathing room to kind of stop and take like a mini break and to experience the joy and the wonder of a very sentimental and sanitized sort of December. Like Hallmark movies sort of clean up the story of this month for me. Because here's what I know. If you have breath and you're in this room, Decembers are chaotic, aren't they? I see heads nodding a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's a busy time, right? From wrapping up the semester, some of you are students trying to wrap up, the, or, or parents helping students wrap up the semester, to actually wrapping up gifts that you have to uniquely get for every single person on your list. To having to be on all December. Y'all know what I'm talking about, being on, not being able to shut down as there's so much going on. Maybe you're in charge of bringing the magic of Christmas to your family while also magically getting every gift they have on their list. And then forget about your own self-care. Right? You're, you're caring for the cares of others, right? And so we just kind of lift up the, the little tree skirt and, 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 st and all the things that we're worried about or that stresses out or make us stressed about ourselves. We kind of push under and say, I'll worry about that in the new year. Not now. Oh, and then there's church, of course. You got, you got to go to church. It's Advent, right? You got to show up. You got to sing the songs. Angels we have heard on high, right? Luckily, that's a given. So rest assured, right? We know the story of Advent. We know the story so well. We don't have to sanitize it and put a bow on it and put lights all around it to make it anything special because it's Jesus. And Jesus is perfect, Listen, I would normally agree. In fact, I would, I would normally preach in that vein during this Advent season. But once you start digging around 
Jesus genealogy, Jesus family tree, which again, like I said, opens the gospel of Matthew, turns out it's not so perfect. Now listen, hear me say, I'm not calling Jesus not perfect. I'm saying that the, the characters, the people in his life leading up to his birth, it's kind of messy. In fact, I wonder if the spies knocking on that door as they move into the promised land knew whose door they were knocking on when the door opened to a future relative of Jesus named Rahab. The book of Joshua is the story of the Israelites coming into the promised land, the land that God had promised all of his descendants, starting with Abraham, who Maggie preached on so well last week. You remember maybe the end of Deuteronomy. The story goes that the, the, there's this dude named Moses, and he, he's led all these people, he's a big deal, he's led all these people out of Egypt, out of slavery, uh, across the Red Sea, and out into the wilderness for 40 years. And he leads them all the way to the edge of the promised land of Canaan. But Moses, if you remember, doesn't get to go inside. Right? So he hands over the reins to this dude named Joshua. And that's where our story picks up today. When the spies get to the door, the only description we have is a prostitute named Rahab. So the Bible's complicated already. That's all it says about her for us to know, which for a woman in Scripture, that's more than what we normally get. That's a whole other sermon. We can assume some suspicions about her life pretty easily based on the story, but why did the author see it fit to deem her that title? It's perplexing, but it's there. So we have to navigate it. Spies knock on the door. She lets them inside. She hides them. She lies about it to some of the king's servants who come knocking on the door. Then she makes this interesting declaration of her recognition of God's reign. And, and then she, she starts bargaining with them about being kind to them because she's been kind, being kind to her because she's been kind to them. And at the very end of the chapter, which we didn't read, she sends them on their way. She gives them explicit instructions on how to get out of the city and to get back to the camp there in Israel. You know, the particular actions of Rahab are not necessarily like crazy right off the bat. They are normal actions someone who fears God, who loves God, who wants to do God's will would do. But if we read between the lines of this story, the story is anything but clear commentators on the story, people who have written whole papers, dissertations on this very narrative, they rarely agree, which is laughable. Normally you see some through lines that are similar, but in this story, it's all over the place. Like you have one guy saying how smart the spies were to have gone to that house because people would have been visiting and leaving and visiting and leaving. Often maybe they could have gotten a scoop of what was going down in the city and kind of had that wisdom to take back to their camp. While other people will say, it's an idiot that the spies would have gone over to the red light district of Canaan, of Canaan to go hide there. It a mistake. One person says that, that Rahab is the ideal convert for the Jewish people. She's perfect. And then other people would say, oh, everything that she said about God was not really real. She's using that language, the spies' language, to get her own difficulty of this story we read this morning from Joshua 2 is we don't really know what to do with Rahab. We don't really know how to categorize her. And honestly, that's something we're really good at doing. We are label-wielding people, aren't we? Someone does something, label. Someone looks or acts or thinks or votes or chooses some way to do life, label. We wish them on their way. But there are too many gaps in the story. Like, why Rahab? Who is Rahab? Why did she hide the spies? Why did she make this confession about God so boldly, especially about a God who wasn't her own? Remember, uh, her name, Rahab, is connected to the great Egyptian sun god named Ra. Rahab, Ra. And where did the Israelites just come from? 
Egypt, why? For 40 years, they've been running away from Egypt, and yet the first thing they do is to go run to this person. What are they doing going back to Egypt in a way? Rahab's life was not easily defined. As a prostitute, she would have been uh, tolerated in society, but she would have been dishonored. She wouldn't have been outlawed from the world, but she certainly would have been an outcast. She wouldn't have been welcomed. She would have been a marginalized person in the city that she called her home. And maybe that's why she found it so easy to lie to the king's messengers who said, hey, where are those spies? Why she found it so easy to lie to such people of power because she was so powerless. That alone should have dissuaded the spies from even entering in to that house, going even closer in. And yet there's even one more part, one step further, is that Rahab was also a Canaanite. She was a foreign woman, woman. The spies know the law of Moses. And they know that, that, that foreign women are bad news for Israelites. They're the ultimate transgressor. They're the ultimate enemy just based on how she's born. They know the law of Moses. They were alongside Moses when he was putting it together, where God was giving it to him. And Deuteronomy 7 leaves almost no exception. Hear this word from Deuteronomy 7. When the Lord your God brings you into the land you are entering to possess and drives you out before many of the nations, here's what you need to do. Go and destroy them totally. Make no treaty with them. Show them no mercy. Do not intermarry with them. Do not uh, give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. Or they will turn your children away from me, from following me to serve other gods. And the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. Yeah, that's that's not a lot of room for exception, is it? Rahab, in all that she is, is everything Israel would not like to connect to their salvation. She is the anti-hero with a messy story. And yet, When the spies go back to Joshua, the people of Israel, and tell them what they encountered on their journey, they quote Rahab directly. They don't tell all they accomplished on their espionage. All they do is they tell about what this foreign woman said about God because her words describe God were better than their own. The word of the enemy was better than their own words about God. A few chapters later in chapter 6, the people of Israel have made their way into Jericho, and they show up uh, and march around the walls. You've probably heard the song about the battle of Jericho, right? So for the first six days, they march around shouting God's name, and on the seventh day, they march around seven times. Seven is a big number in the Bible, and they keep shouting that word, and they're praising God. And on the seventh day, as the song goes, the walls come a-tumbling down all around them. And Joshua, before this happens, says these words to the spies, give them instructions. And here's the words from Joshua 7. Go into, or Joshua 6, go into the prostitute's house and bring her out and all who belong to her in accordance with your oath and to her. So the young men who had done the spying went in and brought out Rahab, her father and her mother and her siblings and all who had belonged to them and her. And they brought out her entire family and put them in a place outside of the camp of Israel. And then they burned the whole city and everything in it. But Joshua spared Rahab with her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho. And she lives among the Israelites to this day. I don't know, y'all. Maybe this author of the story didn't know what to do with Rahab either. And that's why there's just so many gaps for us even today as 21st century readers. But, you know, like we do really well, you think the writer could have maybe like cleaned up the story, like not kept her in, you know, hallmarked the story, like make it approachable, make it perfect, keep her out of the narrative, sanitizing the ending, but really honestly sanitizing Rahab the most. Another hallmark movie 
that uh, doesn't get much cred is the classic Christmas in Dollywood. <laughs> I love that movie. Uh, it's, it's just some sort of light that Dolly's, Dolly Parton's presence brings into the world sometimes, just her situation. Reminds me of an interview she did with the BBC a long time ago, talking about growing up as a poor person in uh, eastern Tennessee. Uh, the, the interviewer, this British dude, asked her, uh, when did Dolly Parton, she's, he's saying this to her, when did Dolly Parton, as we know her, appear? And Dolly said back to him, well, I really... Partnered, uh, partnered my look with this country girl ideas of glamour after what, they, what we called the, the town tramp. Uh, this woman, I thought she was beautiful. She had this beautiful peroxide hair piled up on her head and red high heels and red nails. And I just thought she was the prettiest thing I had ever seen. Their mom was there on the interview with her and she said this, oh honey, she ain't nothing but trash. And I love Dolly's response to her. She said this, that's what I want to be, mama. I want to be trash. One of the wonderful things about this story is you can tell that Dolly Parton saw this woman in a different way, like the way God sees us, not as trash, but as treasure. Here's the truth, friends, and you know this. Every family that exists has folks, consciously or unconsciously, that think of people in their family tree as trash, people they would rather keep secret about, keep out of the family pictures, keep their skeletons in the closet because they're too eccentric, they say, because they don't fit the family mold, because they've dishonored the family in some way. Maybe you can think of the person in your family, of who that might be. and Maybe that person's you. But, friends, if you think your family is weird, Jesus' family will out-dysfunction anything your family brings to the table. Have you read Matthew 1? Liars, thieves, frauds, murderers, manipulators, passive aggressives, and people who are just messy abound in Jesus' family roots. And according to the Bible, that's good news. It turns out God doesn't choose perfect people to get God's message or God's messenger out into the world. God chooses people with struggles like you and me, actual people to speak about God's truth in the world. In the genealogy of Jesus, the people that have been abused or marginalized or mistreated are, 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 are exalted, not erased from the story of God, which is more good news me and for you. And so friends, I want to close by saying this on December 4th, the second Sunday of Advent 22. Hear these words as we go throughout the rest of the month. Friends, your story this Advent season doesn't have to be a Hallmark movie. It doesn't have to be perfect. Release the need for it to be. Also hear this, your mistakes are not too deep for God's grace. I know that sounds like a simple truth, but we need to hear the simpleness of that powerful statement. Your mistakes are not too deep for God's grace. And God's goodness toward you doesn't base itself on your goodness in the world. It doesn't. God's goodness comes to you whenever you need it because God is a good God. And it turns out, that the best plot line we can follow this Advent season, and dare I say every single day of our lives, is that what comes from the great mess of this life that we live, out of it comes an even greater Messiah. May it be so. Amen. Let's pray together. Gracious God, it is so... Um, uh, it's just easy sometimes. It's hard, but we, it's easy to fall into the trap of just wanting to look perfect when we enter into this space, seeming like we all have it together, uh, to cleaning up, making sure we don't have any flaws because uh, you're perfect, and so we got to try to be like that too. But as we look at your family tree and, and, and what you could do through the, the lineage of Jesus, we know um, there are folks who struggled. There are folks who made bad decisions. There are folks who messed up. And yet you used 
the mistakes, the things we, we, we wrote off could never be redeemed. And you redeemed all of them in the end through your son, Jesus. And that's a hard truth to carry with us day in and day out, especially in Decembers when they are bananas. But God, give us the courage to believe that truth. To believe that your goodness to us doesn't account to our goodness or how well we do. But that if we just present ourselves as vessels of love and grace and peace as we lit that candle today in the world, that you truly can use all of us. Thank you, God, for the story of Rahab, as messy as it is, you worked within her life and you still work within ours. That is good news. That is the hope, of the birth of your son, Jesus. Might we carry that hope this day and every day. Amen.